So to start today, I want to take a look at accessibility. Like what, what is web accessibility? Web accessibility means that people with disabilities can use the web. I would say that's probably the most common definition that um, I encounter. And we'll, we'll take that as is for the moment. Um, and, but then you have to ask, well, what is it really? How do you define it? That's actually a really hard task. Um, so what we can do is take a look at maybe some of the different types of disabilities. Can anyone name some? I heard visual. Yes, that's, a, that's probably the most Hearing. obvious. Hearing, yes. So auditory. Sorry? Uh, yes, so learning um, is actually a really big umbrella term. Uh, it's on the list. Other Concentration, um, you know, can only concentrate in very small. small Interestingly, it's lumped with learning disabilities. Physical, yes. So that's the other, probably more obvious one. And then I, I don't know that anyone will actually ever get this one. Is touch. Um, it we rarely talk about this because. So rarely is it something you have to accommodate for, but it actually literally talks about the lack of sensation to touch. Um, and that is considered a disability in, in some cases. I mean, obviously it depends on who you're working with and whatnot. Um, and in web accessibility, that's even obviously less common. But I also want you to think about that these are in no way just like one type of disability. It, it is a category. But all of them have a scale. All of them uh, actually cover more than what we commonly maybe talk about. So, for example, with auditory, we think about deafness as an auditory disability. But this might actually refer to other hearing issues, such as having difficulty focusing on a single voice when there's a lot of noise around. Um, even uh, and learning, as I said, is a very large kind of umbrella term. Uh, includes dyslexia and other reading disability, but dysphasia um, and other related issues with writing and um, I don't even remember the term right now. But uh, the other one, um, but almost like anything to do with concentration or anything like that, they're all lumped under learning disabilities. So I'm not even ask you why they just are. Um, so, you know, even though we talk about these types of disability, there really is a range. It really does cover a lot of different things that we might not typically think about. Visual could include like all visual Yes, that's right. And we will talk about that. So, the other thing is why should we care? I mean, you know, the group of people that we're referring to, and people with a disability are admittedly a minority, and not all of them need special consideration, especially for web and online content. And that may be true. You might actually be surprised by facts. According to Statistics Canada, mind you, this is from the 2012 survey, so it's a little older, um, but I don't think it's gone down. About 10% of working age Canadians had a disability. I don't think that's dropped down at all. If anything, um, the number may have actually gone up based on the people willing to report uh, their disability and what is considered a disability. So that actually means the number of people with a disability is larger than any one group of ethnic or visible minority in this country. It's actually quite large. So, of course, uh, there's policy and legislation. There's no specific legal act actually uh, covering Canadians with disabilities, um, but there are some existing acts that may apply to accessibility and treatment of those uh, with disabilities. <coughs> and I'm not going to cover all of them, um, but they do include 
The Canadian Human Rights Act, as many of you will know, ensures equal opportunity to individuals for federally re uh, regulated activities, which basically means anything that's federally funded, and that will cover most post-secondary institutions. Um, in BC, again, we don't have anything that is specifically for disabilities. Um, in Ontario, they do. We don't have it in BC. Um, but it, you, I mean, this, this is a, a concern. The federal government got sued a few years ago. Uh, the person who brought it up to the court won. That's why the federal government actually went through a huge process to make all of their websites um, accessible. And while no one has really pushed that to federally funded programs beyond the actual government, it can happen. Um, and of course, at JIBC, you actually have a policy uh, to accommodate students with disabilities. So uh, that is actually a link my slide will be made available through the, uh, the top office. We we'll have all the links and everything. Um, I'm sure you can also search for it and find it. But of course, despite the fact that there is a policy and there's a related procedure document as well, um, and you might be convinced, but what about other people? Getting by it um, is something that I get asked about all the time because People often ask me about this because despite the fact that there's a policy or anything, a lot of people aren't convinced. Um, and usually, too often, it's because it's so side as being too difficult, time-consuming. Um, ugly was another common one that I've encountered, um, which, as a side note, is not true. Um, Gov.uk was in the media quite a bit for uh, a period of time, not only because of the actual project, but also because of the design of the website um, and the fact that it's fully really accessible. Uh, in the US, there's uh, actually really like this one. This is the US Department of Interior. It just looks really pretty. I don't know. <laughs> I just like it because it's pretty. Uh, but it's accessible, right? Like it doesn't. There's, there's nothing that says that web, accessible websites are ugly. I mean, only in the sense that on websites, there are some that are ugly and some that are nice looking. Same with accessible websites. Some are ugly and some are nice looking. Um, and there are, of course, a lot of benefits. So, I mean, obviously, it reflects institutional <coughs> mission, leadership, and values because you have a policy at JIBC. Um, but not only that, it actually serves all your users, not just those with disabilities. And we'll talk a little bit more about this as well. Which administrator doesn't like this one? Makes sound fiscal policy. And because it actually improves um, efficiency, it can reduce costs uh, while maintaining quality, avoid retrofitting, because making a website or anything else, um, imagine a building, you build a building, and after you build a building, someone says, oh, but you have to make it accessible. Can you imagine how much it would cost to retrofit a building to make it accessible after you're already done? And in many ways, development, online, everything is the same thing. It costs so much more to do it afterwards than to just build it. Um, of course, it is uh, it, it avoids equity for your students, avoids litigation, which you know I talked about as a possibility. Um, it also fulfills usually grants and contract requirements. Some of the grants that you apply for for research, like especially faculty, um, they might have some requirements around accessibility and accommodation uh, for those with disabilities. Um, and of course, it adds value to the institution itself. You have better content, benefits more people, easier to maintain and update, you have higher compatibility with software and hardware. I mean, there's there's a whole bunch of reasons, right? So, simplified version. Findable, accessible, shareable, efficient, and collaborative. Some of those may not be very obvious at the moment, but um, we'll get there. Of course, knowing why 
doesn't tell you about how to approach accessibility. So let's get to it. So whether you want to or because you're told to, half the battle, of course, is figuring out just how to approach accessibility. Um, if, like many others, you see accessibility as something at the end of the checklist, then perhaps we will deal with it. But accessibility often gets pigeonholed as simply making sure there are no barriers to access for screen readers or other assistive technology without regard to usability. So just because something is accessible does not mean it's usable. <coughs> but first, let's take a look at her point on assistive technology. Assistive technology typically refers to just technology that assists those who need it to access content. This is particularly used for web and online content. Um, and say as part of your approach, you want to make sure that your content is accessible to all technology. So you start with maybe screen readers on your list, because that's the fairly kind of obvious one. Um, and you do some more research. Say you find some other things, you start adding text-to-speech software, which again is uh, similar but not the same. Anyone know the difference between the two? So the difference is that text-to-speech typically just um, is normally when you have whatever text is on the screen and it reads it out to you. Screen readers is different in that it also sort of reads out um, the what they are and the purpose. So for example, um, it would say that link to subtext, right? Whereas text-to-speech needs to tell you that this is a link or whatever it is. Uh, the difference being that text-to-speech is typically used, again, by those with uh, learning disabilities who prefer things in audio. So they use text-to-speech because it helps them so that they don't have to read the text on the screen, but they still get it. But because they're not uh, visually impaired, they can see that it's a link, they know that they can click on it and go elsewhere. Whereas a screen reader would read the fact that it's a link, that this is an image, that this is a header, that sort of thing. So it gives all the semantics around the text as well. Okay, so those are kind of maybe obvious, um, usually when you find it. Um, some other things are like actually screen magnifiers, so we talked about how the visual disabilities on a scale, so those who have visual impairments but can still see. Um, I know lots of people, even I use the Zoom on my browser sometimes because it's on a website. Uh, you might find joysticks. Joysticks are kind of like a mouse, except they're more joystick for those with physical disabilities. Um, but then you start looking some more and you're like, oh wait, what about those mobile devices? These things that we all carry in our pockets. Well, guess what? Your mobile device comes with a screen reader. It comes with text-to-speech. So because of the accessibility features on it, you want to think about mobile devices. Well, what about keyboards for keyboard accessibility? Is there anyone who hasn't touched either a keyboard or a mobile device today? <laughs> right? So, the point, at this point, you might realize that old technology is assistive technology. We can't create content for a single piece of technology. This is actually from 2012, and these are just Android um, mobile kits. <coughs> Only Android. <laughs> and from 2012. There's more now. Uh, and of course, you add all the Windows phones and Apple devices, it gets to be a lot more. So there are too many potential devices and ways people are using devices to do that. We aren't even necessarily creating content for people because there is no average or normal user. So what we're doing is actually we're creating for potential situations. And the other thing you need to think about is because conditions, including physical or environmental ones, can be temporary. Imagine that someone gets into an accident, they're in a wheelchair or in crutches for a temporary amount of time. Imagine that I turned off these lights, well, you would be in darkness for a temporary time. Imagine that you're sitting outside in the sun. Okay, not today, but. <laughs> But the idea is bright lights, 
glare on the screen. That's a very temporary thing and a very environmental one, not one that you can easily control. So the idea is that we start thinking not about accessibility and something off of a checklist, but about universal design. So universal design is uh, defined as the design of products and environments to be usable by all people to the greatest extent possible without the need for adaptation or specialized design. This is kind of what it looks like in the poster space. Um, the term universal design was originally coined um, by the architect Romney. So the principles uh, were originally based on physical space. But these key, uh, the, the principles can be summarized by these key ideas. That it's equitable, flexible, that be simple, intuitive, low effort, approachable, and usable. So one of the most well-known examples is a wheelchair ramp. Anyone recognize this company? Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, well, it's also at the bottom of this slide there. So here's a thought exercise, which I'll give you just a moment to think about. So other than wheelchair users, what groups of people might need to use a ramp like this? Stroller? Yes. Uh, yes, a walker. I like a skateboard. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Why not? Someone on a skateboard. Crutches. Yes. Honestly, anything with a wheel, right? So the guns, the wheels. Mm -hmm. um, and but you know, like you say, it doesn't even have to be on a walker. It could be crutches. Could be a senior who just could even be just an not a senior, but a person with say knee problems. Mm -hmm. right. um, short legs. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just anyone with difficulty with stairs would use it, right? Or even for fun. You know, like you say, skateboards, kids, we love running up those things. Um, but in terms of actual need, right? Like can't use anything else. Typically it would be anything almost with wheels. Um, and again, anyone with uh, some kind of physical disability. So many places now call it an access ramp or even just ramp to uh, replace its, reflect its greater universal application. So the goal here is to make your web uh, content accessible and usable to your whole audience without trying to specifically accommodate for one group. And hopefully as I go through some of these guidelines and suggestions, it will occur to you what groups of people might benefit other than those uh, with the disabilities that you can So, let's get into the actual nitty gritty. Kind of like that. So, regardless whether you're creating your content in an online system such as Blackboard um, or document editing software such as Microsoft Word, uh, there are a few simple guidelines you can follow to make your content more accessible. Let's start with some general writing tips. First one is to use consistent language. Uh, if students are given additional readings, you don't want to use additional readings in one place and then optional readings in another. At least within one course, uh, you want to be consistent. Uh, even better if you're consistent across courses. Uh, but at the very least, within one course, uh, you want to be consistent. And that's, of course, true for online content, but also even print documents. Uh, write out acronyms the first time you use it. This is true for all of your students. I don't know how many times as a student I read something and I was like, I don't know what that acronym is because I haven't been in this school for very long or I haven't even been in this subject. And it's the first time I'm taking this subject. Um, this happens all the time in the profession, right? You read an article and you're like, wow, this person uses so many acronyms and just, I don't even know what they all are. Um, So, of course, be clear and concise. Um, this is 
So there's been a lot of research about how people read online versus in print, and how a lot of the times uh, when you read online, you tend to skim a lot more uh, than typically in print. I haven't linked to all the research. It's kind of out there. There's a lot of it. Um, and so more typically, you would use shorter paragraphs, much shorter paragraphs. Uh, you would use lists more often, and that sort of thing. Uh, it, it's just a, it's, it just really is the way that we read online content in general, that most of the time we tend to just scroll through a lot more. And while we don't want to encourage it, at the same time, it does help break up the text. If you ever see a really long paragraph that takes up an entire screen, you know, I would, you know, print format, I would probably get a little scared uh, of that sometimes. So those are only the ones that are specific to writing style or the use of words. Um, I mean, I will cover the structure and commercial type of content as well. There we go. Okay. So the first thing I want to cover is headings. So imagine that you're writing a report. Um, think about how you would structure the headings. You probably have a title. This in my presentation. Um, so this would be your header one. You would have various topics, right? So a header two, subtopics, header three. Uh, there is four, five, and six typically in most editing software, excuse me, or online tools. Um, really depends on how much you break down the topic. Now. You want to apply the same ideas to web content. There's no reason that your web content is any different than writing print content in this way. So the one thing, though, of course, the difference is that a lot of the times when you are thinking only about print, it's about how it looks visually on the page so that it is distinctly a title and then a header and you know like a subtopic header. What you want to make sure you do is that um, when you create online content is that you're using the headers that are given to you so that you're not using font size uh, and things like bold to distinguish your headers from the rest of your text. So using styles. Microsoft Word has this wonderful ribbon now to help you look at all of these things. Um, if for some reason you don't see it, there's that arrow kind of there, the line with the arrow on the down. So that just shows you kind of all the styles that are uh, available in that area. Otherwise, use the down arrow. It's all like it's different. Like it's actually this long. Every time you hit the down arrow, it just kind of shows you the next row of styles. Uh, so this is how it looks in Word 2007 or newer. Hopefully, you are on that version <laughs> at this point. Um, if you are on an older version, or if you're on Mac and you're on Word, it will look a little different, but the idea is the same. Um, in other software, online editors usually use the drop down. That's actually, I think, uh, what is that? I think actually that's the Mac version of Word. <laughs> so uh, it's, and then but again, online editors, they look similar, right? It's a drop down menu, you say, okay, this is header one, this is header two. Um, some programs have keyboard shortcuts, Word, for example, um, have the keyboard shortcuts to assign headers, and then you can look it up based on all the time. And if you don't like the look of the header, you can't do this on online content, but you know, in Word, for example, you can do that. So you can actually you can actually go to say your, your header and then say, okay, I want it, uh, you know, font size 18, I want it in this font, I want it in like a dark blue instead of a black. And then what you can do is actually select that bit of text, and then if you right click on the header. Um, style, then you can say update to 
to match the selection. Okay. The other option, of course, is to go to right click on it and then hit modify. So from the modify screen, you say, I want it to be size 18, blah, 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 blah. Yes. Could you explain to us again using styles rather than just making it full of size 18? Um, so, as I was saying, the difference is that well, when you print it, it doesn't really make any difference. But as, an, but as online content, it makes a big difference. So, if you ever export it, which actually I will talk about, uh, is it exporting it to PDF? Or you may not normally give out your documents, but when you have a print disabled student, for example, they will probably want it in Word format. So if you have it in Word format, there is no reason to send off some PDF to another, like Colleen Gare, <laughs> where Kaker is, um, and then have them turn it back into a Word format document, right? So, you know, if, especially for faculty, they create, you know, and even as staff, you do create these documents all the time. In, Word, that's fine. Um, I do it all the time as well. But the idea is that by using the header styles, um, <coughs> someone who uses a screen reader or um, even um, learning software like Kurzweil, they, uh, the software will be able to tell that these are headers. And one of the things that you can actually do if you ever look at a Word document is um, or any kind of document that works in the LibreOffice or OpenOffice 2, uh, is that you can look at the navigator. And the navigation actually shows you just a list of headers. Imagine a book without headers. That is basically what would happen in the navigation if you didn't use the header styles. You would have no headers in that list. Whereas if you use the heading styles, when you look in the navigation, I have a thousand page document sitting on my computer. If I did not have headings to actually figure out what it was, I would, like, I would be lost, even as a visual person. I have a huge document. By using headers in the navigation area, you get a list of headers, and it's indented depending on what level of header you have. So I can collapse headers, I can show them, um, and in the outline view, I can see, I can say, okay, show me only up to level three. Only show me up to level two. And while typically you don't do that um, necessarily, it is how people do use it. You never know how your document is going to be used. I was just curious from the accessibility perspective how the heading helps. Right, so it's all about navigation. Okay. Uh, that's the main, main thing. Um, the other thing actually is that it can help you. So if you have a whole bunch of headings in your document, well, if you modify that and you didn't make any like specific changes, um, <coughs> and you modify that heading style, it'll change all of your heading styles to what you modify. You don't have to go change each one. You change it once and it changes it for all of them. You can also change it so that um, that's what it looks like for all of your documents. That's one of the options in there. You don't have to do it for every document. If that's the way you like it, you can change it so that that's the default for all of your documents. So there, there are, you know, advantages for your own sake in terms of editing documents and using these styles as well. And of course, you can create custom styles and all that. There's like all sorts of things you can do with styles. And the headings um, are the, the, the main thing um, because they mark the level uh, of the documents. It marks it. it it improves the, the navigation um, a huge amount. It's less probably important for really short documents, but the longer it is, the more important. Yes? So if you're posting, if you convert a word to PDF and post it on the website or in the course, you're saying it doesn't take over into that hidden reference to heading 
so on from the it web Actually, it does, which is one of the reasons why. And I'll talk about exporting the PDF as well. That is one of the reasons why you do it. So, and I, like I say, this is an example of how to do it in Word. But, um, you know, any document or content that may end up on Uh, okay, and as I said, unfortunately, you don't have the choice in the looks when you're using an editor inside of an online system to go after the email. Uh, so keep in mind that it helps keep the content consistent across the institution. That's actually one of the things that, for visual users, it is so much better to have these things consistent across courses, across web pages, because they will see it and they will immediately know that that, the more they see it, the more that it just kind of clicks in their head, oh, that's a heading. And that's a certain level of heading as well. Okay, so let me just briefly go. size and color. Okay, so for font face, uh, I suggest Arial or Demo, but really any sans serif font, um, there, which there are many, many to choose from. Um, in case you don't know the difference, here's a quick explanation. A serif is a small line attached to the end of a stroke in a letter, which is what you see circled in the top example. Serifs come in different styles. They can be rounded, straight edge, um, but are basically small decorative pieces. So sans serif fonts do not have these little serifs that are decorated pieces, which can frequently make them easier to read. So for headings, you know, use kind of whatever you want, really. And actually, it's very typical to use um, a serif font for headings. But for regular, like the body text, um, it's recommended that you use a sans serif. No. This is your traditional form. Yeah. It's it's the little lines how we buy and close from one letter to the next. So the Yeah, it's it's interesting. I will say that the the research around this says one thing and another and there is argument in the community about exactly which is better. Um, but this is typic this is a typical recommendation for uh, like you say it's, it's more for online content. I find it very odd sometimes that it's different for print and uh, screen reading, but I think part of it has to do again with the fact that typically most people for whatever reason on the screen they tend to scroll more. Well and lighting is different. Like that, like right, that and the, the lighting the lighting is different, but also part of it is like reading stuff. Um, that is the recommendation. Um, I don't like I say print is a is a little different. I would, although I would argue that either actually works honestly if your font is big enough and that sort of thing. Um, so I would say font size twelve or higher. That's a kind of a minimum. Uh, you can make it bigger. The color, like think higher is fine. Uh, for headers, you, I mean, you just want to increase it again, make it look a little different. A spacing will also do that for terms of looks. Um, so if your body is 12, um, your header might, your header three might be 14, header two might be 16, header one might be 18. But again, the two points is actually a pretty small gap. The bigger the difference, the easier it is, of course, to spot the difference. Uh, so, I mean, this is kind of a minimum recommendation is a two point difference. So, of course, you can use bold and italics to differentiate headers. Um, again, as long as you still use the styles within uh, your document editor, of course, you can make it look different. But the main thing is that when you use those styles, it does change. For font colors, um, black or default? I say default 
is another choice because in some cases, such as lakes, um, you may want to leave it as the standard blue color. Um, the most important thing is that there is a high contrast between the background and your color. Uh, you, and you want to avoid relying on font color to relay your message. So the standard blue font and underline for links is, is, is fine. Um, people are used to it. People yeah. are, uh, understand that that is a, it's a visual helper. But it is a helper. No one needs to rely on the fact that it's blue to know that it's a link. Because even if you made it a different color, your browser can help you. I'll talk about color contrast a little more too later on. Um, again, you may not have a choice in an online system, but if you notice any issue, definitely I would say let the appropriate person or the department know. Um, and then, you know, there's no reason not to voice your concerns. I want to briefly talk about tables. Tables should only be used for information and data that should be presented in a tabular form. Meaning that you should not be using tables for layout purposes. So, for example, if you need your content in two columns, use color feature. That is a feature in your document editor, so please use it. Uh, of course, if you do have a table, you want to make use of proper header columns and rows. Um, if your table is quite complex, you might want to provide a summary, something like this. I would not consider complex, so it stands as is. Um, when you create tables and document applications, again, Word as an example, that table creation tool, insert this tool with this or this table with this many rows and this many columns. Um, but I, the difference is that I know some people to create what looks like a table, they just use tabs to try to make the text align instead of inserting a table with this many rows. I'm assuming the screen readers or whatever will interpret the table and think that it's headers and it's not headers and so on. Because I think of some context where I would use a table because of the layout, because it would be so much more complex to do with tabs and so on. Well, it forms as they know, complex form. Where a table is just so much easier to lay out. If you don't have headers, then you know you don't use it that way. You hide your lines and just use the layout. Yeah, I know. Uh, forms is definitely one where a few see tables used. Uh, it, I mean, again, it partly depends. The idea is that whenever someone needs the accommodation, usually they will ask for a PDF or um, a Word document. Um, or if you're putting this content online, you don't want, really don't want to use a table to for your if you know that that document will absolutely never be given to anyone else in electronic format, then yeah, okay, use your table for your layout because if no one else is ever going to see it, then no one's going to care that you're using a table for the layout. But if it's course content, if it's an online form, if it's any of those things, Someone else will see it in the online, um, in, an, in an electronic format. Does it make a difference if you lock the form down or if you create a PDF form, a table, a Word document, where does the PDF then create the PDF form and put it in here? Right? Like, okay, the, yes. will the reader pick up the difference between the, the underlying table and the actual open accessible field for the printer data? Actually, when you do PDF, or I'm not sure. The, the reason why is that even though you can only fill in certain fields, don't forget that the rest of it is still readable. And for a screen reader, it's really confusing if you say this is a table and all of a sudden it's not tabular information. It's all about the fact that whenever you use table, it should semantically be a table. Um, and, and that's just the way that the, the screen reader or something will pick it up. I will admit that when you convert it specifically into a PDF form, I'm not sure what happens, but typically with a PDF document, if you convert a table from Word 
when you export it as a PDF, it will still be coded as a table in the in the PDF. So just about anything you code in Word that will translate into a PDF document. The only major difference is that it's a PDF instead of a document. Can you go in like I don't want an image, you know what an image you have that background data that you provide both the image and all the text and stuff like that for sure the folder. Is there anything to be able to override the underlying text that describes the image? Try to trick it to what it actually is? You can do it afterwards in, in a PDF editor. Because in a PDF editor, like if you have especially if you have like the pro version of Acrobat, um, or I think even in the standard version. As long as the PDF is editable, editable, then you can go and delete the fact that it's a table and try to keep the layout the same. So PDFs can be edited after, but again, it's it's never a good idea to do it. So better to use tabs because you can set the position of a tab in Word. So you can say, I want my tab to end here for all of these lines. Or you can, and you can set multiple tabs. You can say, okay, I want five different tabs, and this is where they should end up every time the tab. So it's it's better to use tabs for that kind of thing, for just regular text, if you're just trying to get things to be aligned. But if it is tabular data, then it should definitely be a table. Um, and yes, because again, if you export to PDF or you paste it into an online editor, um, that information is carried over. Uh, the one thing that Word doesn't actually do properly is um, that you can't actually mark it header. By bolding it, um, that will help to a certain extent because the fact um, it will be read a little differently in some screen readers. In Word, though, there's actually no way to do that. In, in, the, in a PDF editor like Acrobat, you can't actually assign which ones are headers. In a table, yeah. In Word, there is no actual like semantically. There's no way to say that. Yeah, but that would be on the side. Would that be within the cell? Yeah. Like it's in the style that you create. Okay. Yeah. Unfortunately, no, because semantically, it's still there's no like there's no kind of thing in the computer. <laughs> that tells the screen reader this is bad. Unfortunately, not in work. It, that's just, um, but PDFs, for example, you could do it afterwards. So after you export it to PDF, in Acrobat, you can say this is a header. This is a table, or this is this is a table. Like yeah, either column or a row. Um, so I don't call it more row. And if you ever do it in HTML, Right. This would be if you have access to the code part of an online editor. It's pretty simple. Um, this is what it would look like if you're. Uh, yeah, I have to look at it again. <laughs> this is what it would look like if uh, your header is the first column. If your header is the first row, then all of the header cells would be in that first area. Again, this is just kind of to give you an idea of what it looks like. Um, and this is kind of what. Acrobat would do if you wouldn't edit it. It would actually just mark which ones are headers and which ones are. So this is and this is just a basic table. Uh, most of the time you'll be using whatever editor um, is built in. So you know, usually some kind of drop down to say I want a table with this many rows and this many columns. Um, and that is pretty typical. So Links, such a common thing. It's so simple. It's so important. The text for every link should be descriptive and generally unique uh, within a single page. So imagine that there is no other text around it except the title of the page. Would you understand what the top link is for? It could be anything. I don't even remember what I put as a link. Honestly, I don't remember. It is a link. It goes somewhere. It probably just goes to Google, or it might actually also go to GIBC. Um, but I don't remember myself because this text is not descriptive in any way. Whereas obviously the one below that, 
I know where that link goes. So, I mean, it is in context in the sense that, okay, like you have a title to your page. Generally, someone knows what page they've kind of landed on. This is the JIPC website. Um, it's the page on accommodations uh, for students with disabilities. So they kind of know like what page they've landed on because there is a title to your page. But would they be able to understand where that link goes to if they had none of like the bot text directly? Is the question. And if you can't do it yourself, if you've written the content, don't expect other people to. No one can mind you. <laughs> At least not yet. Um, I'll just make a quick note here that if you ever deal with equations, especially in mathematics, um, but also in obviously other sciences or even just basic arithmetic, um, simple arithmetic can be done by checking it out and making sure that there are spaces between the number symbols. The yeah, end. That, that is simple arithmetic right there. It'll read your mind. Anything more complex, like, I'm thinking really complex though. Calculus. Formula. Um, you'll probably get into math and out. If you don't know what that is, you're probably not in the <laughs> area. It's okay. You don't need to know it um, unless you're kind of really getting into that. So let's talk about media. Talk about I mentioned images. Uh, here we go. Images need a whole text. Uh, it's going to be to call. Full name is alternative text, um, typically shortened to alt text. So the idea is that when you uh, you need to include it so that there is descriptive information in the image. While the text is not visible to most users, the system technology will read the alternate text as a description of the image, so you write concisely while still providing an accurate description of the image. The important point that is your description should be what the image is trying to convey. Picture of a red panda in an English class might describe facial expression and possible emotion. <coughs> but that same picture in biology class might focus on the size and coat color to say determine age, gender, health, I don't know, like whatever it could be about. So the idea is that the description for a single image will be different depending on the context because it's all about conveying the message. Uh, in Word, you can right click on the image and then choose format picture and then there is an alt text section. If you fill in a description, you can include a very brief description in the title field, um, but everything that I've looked at suggests that that's actually optional and you should only use the description box. Why Word gives you a different option. I have at this point no idea and I would actually be interested in testing it a little further to see what the difference I haven't gotten there. Um, I, honestly, I think the title one is if you export it to HTML. I don't know anyone that does this. Um, but if you export it to PDF, I think the, dis the description field. Once it's exported, 
to be honest. There's a, it really depends on what you're exporting to, which uh, and whether you're using the built-in Word plugin or built-in Word like save to PDF, for example, or whether you're using the Acrobat plugin save to PDF. And that will make a difference too. Generally, most things don't, but this is a, I admit this is one that I don't know all the details about. Um, uh, I would suggest that you might check out the web aim uh, website, which I have linked all over the place around here and where I actually got these images. Um, they might have a little more, but I can see it all. This is an um, example of how it would look in WordPress. It would look similar to most online editors. Um, so many online systems will have a field box for you to enter the whole text when you're inserting the image, rather than having to do it afterwards. Um, but again, it depends. So just look. Uh, the alternative, of course, such as in here, and even in Word, um, you can use a descriptive caption. Of course, the difference is that everyone will see a caption. Um, but if everyone can see it, then you don't need to actually fill in the whole text if it serves the same purpose. So I do actually have a handy flowchart. Uh, <laughs> so um, part of it uh, means that if you're including a picture purely for decorative purposes, um, then you don't need full text either. Basically, a screen reader will just not read it. They'll skip over it. But if it's purely decorative, right, it's just a little bubble that it looks nice or whatever it is. Um, I have a document right now. It's a government, Canadian government document. It has maple leaves in the corner. It looks very pretty. But there's nothing for screen readers and for the understanding of the content. So, uh, in my case, I actually deleted it. But you know you can leave the whole text blank. That's okay. Um, and similarly, if uh, if the image itself is an alternate to a textual explanation, you can leave the whole text empty. And this happens a lot for say tutorials. Um, you, know, you say step one, go here. Step two, do this. And then you might have an image to um, enhance your explanation, but it doesn't add anything to the textual explanation um, in understanding your instructions, in which case, again, you don't need it. Um, I will make also a point about images that if you use colors for figures, just graph, consider very different high contrast colors. Um, you can also, of course, use a mix of color and patterns. The main thing is that if you imagine you printed your document using a black and white printer, would you still be able to properly understand your code figures? Um, if it's data, consider also having the information in tabular textual format. That would be another alternative. Um, and that's the main thing. And of course, that, that goes back to color blindness uh, for the most part. But in general, I mean, if you have three different reds, even I might have problems, you know, figuring out different uh, before. It's just, it also is, it's a, the amount of time it takes for comprehension. If your colors are very different or you use different patterns, it's much easier to see the difference, just visually. It just goes in your head much faster than if you use very similar colors. Um, for all non-text content, um, including visual, audio, and visual material, you should also have an alternative. So for audio, we say text transcript. This is something simple as um, if you don't know the name of the person, you can just use like a general term like woman or man. Captions. Oh, interesting. It's playing on my screen and not on yours. And then you have to turn off the captions. You have to watch. 
happens are uh, the difference between caption and subtitles is that um, this is actually a subtitle, not a caption. They're unlike any creatures on Earth. Captions would actually have um, some of the kind of descriptive text to say things like, oh, thunder or, or you know, that sort of thing. So it, it, the captions actually typically have a bit more information. This is actually a Um, by the way, those are awesome videos. Uh, the Cornell Lab of Ornithology has some wonderful stuff. This is an example of audio description. So the, I mean, just the idea that he's actually describing the action. And it's quite interesting if you actually ever watch um, a movie with descriptive audio because they are very skilled at it in the sense that they have to talk in between what other people are actually talking on screen. So can you imagine someone describing all the action in between when other people are talking? Um, it's, it's quite impressive to see, but it is very expensive to do. Uh, as you can imagine, for someone to sit there, like plan it all out, and then record it, and all of that. Uh, so while the descriptive audio is ideal for visually impaired people watching videos, it's just because it's so costly, um, it's not usually offered unless it's already been produced. Um, if it's there, great. If it's not, um, usually again, what you want to do is include a transcript or some other kind of alternate version Again, if it's not already explained in textual format. If, again, your video is a screenshot version of some instructions on how to do something that you already wrote it in text for someone, you don't need it. Um, you just kind of link someone to the textual version. Just make sure that it doesn't automatically play. Please don't ever have video or audio automatically play. Um, it should have controls. Again, these are usually built into whatever system you're using. Avoid too much flashing. Please do not cause epileptic seizures to anyone. That's actually the main reason why. Um, I do have some resources here if you ever want to take a quick gander at a little bit more. So it's all about having the textual versions. Uh, with video, the caption is still textual, it's just on the video itself. So creating documents, we kind of covered this um, uh, quite a bit already. Um, I will say that when you're in an online environment and you want to copy and paste into Word, many systems have a paste from Word option. So it looks like the regular paste icon, except it has a little Word icon. And basically what it'll do is it'll keep all your general formatting, but remove all of the stuff that Word likes to put in there, but shouldn't be by it on the uh, Invisible. Uh, some of them don't. WordPress, for example, if you ever use that, doesn't actually have this problem anymore, but it does it automatically. Okay. Uh, unfortunately, you don't know that unless you've heard it from me. <laughs> uh, but there you go. So if you post documents, consider um, following some of these same things. Uh, if you ever do lecture notes, PowerPoint, get notes in the actual notes section. So after creating your content, um, you want to check whether it's accessible. Many of the authoring tools do have built-in checkers, um, and they'll walk you through it. So uh, PowerPoint, same thing, looks exactly the same. Um, PDF has a PDF checker. I will warn you that with the PDF checker, uh, it may throw so many things at you that you want to crawl under a table. Uh, so I would, I will warn you that with PDF, um, the checker may not be the thing you want to use the most. However, 
start. Um, if you want to export again or save the PDF, just use the built-in save or uh, save the PDF uh, option. There is a if you have Acrobat installed, it will install it, but Word itself also has just to save the PDF file. And of course, what if you didn't make the PDF? You might be posting someone else's document. Posting a journal article. So you can use the accessibility checker in Adobe Acrobat, but it may pop up so many issues that you don't want to ever look at. We may also be in a situation where Acrobat is in handy for some reason. So, at the most basic, check that your PDF is extrudable. The easiest way to check is try selecting some text. If you can select the text and it doesn't, like it doesn't select the whole page instead, uh, then it's probably text readable. If you really want to make sure you can copy and paste it into Um, if it doesn't paste, I will warn you that sometimes pasting will give you gibberish instead of um, actual text because you don't have the font that the PDF uses. But as long as it pastes something and not just a picture of the whole page, then it's probably text. Um, if you're not sure if you end up selecting the whole page, then it's just an image of text. Um, and you will, it needs to be run through kind of OCR and whatever else. Um, and you probably just want to contact your, the department um, or people staff on hand that will help you make this accessible um, for your students. Again, Usually students will be the ones to self-identify, um, but if running this through an OCR, if Acrobat Pro has that built in, doing that as like a very basic um, kind of step is never a bad idea. There are a lot of online assessment tools. I'm not going to go through these in detail. Part of it is that we're kind of over time. Um, part of it is that I would never expect content Um, most of these are things like that. Color fill, the way shows you a web page in different views um, that screen readers typically will read in for using other kind of specialized tools you'll see. Uh, color filter is actually one where you can it will simulate color blindness of the web page for you. Kind of nice. This check is similar. Color contrast checker is the one that will actually just check the color contrast of the text versus the background in a web page. So that's always fun and there's a lot more. But if you need help, just ask. Um, if you're, if you're not sure or stuck on making your content accessible, contact student services. They're there. Um, obviously, I'm helping with the supporting students with disabilities in the GC website. So when that comes up, it'll be there. Uh, there's lots of articles on webbing. They're the ones uh, who have lots of articles, especially on um, Word and PDF documents, but a lot of other articles as well. One of the things that um, you might consider doing is that to show that you made an effort to create accessible content. So um, you can even have just a simple statement like this. It's a great way to be transparent and show your efforts, but also for students to know, if, especially if it's you know for a term or whatever it is, maybe they didn't know that this service was available. Um, course syllabi are a great place to put this, but any kind of like course information, um, that sort of thing. This is a very simple statement to say that if they need an accommodation of any sort, here's the contact information, right? Um, and of course, encouraging them to do it as early as possible, especially if it's sexual content, to sometimes make accommodations. But that's just an example. Uh, if you ever want to go take a look at more examples, the library has a really good one. Stay 
<laughs> University of Oxford has a pretty good one as well. Um, there are, I mean, lots of other examples. Some I just picked up because they're a bit shorter. I find that some of them are too long. Students do not need like a really long page. They just need to, they just really want to know what is available. So, I got that was a lot of information. If you missed any of that, the recorded session will be there. My slides will be posted, all sorts of things. I'm actually running the talk right now, so it's all there. Um, if there's just one takeaway for today, it really is just that um, you know you have enough resources to make your online content accessible, but that more importantly, you kind of just have not uh, an idea of where to go if you get stuck or if you have questions. You're not allowed in dealing with these issues um, and supporting students or others that are in the institution, and you're not alone as an institution um, and in doing this sort of work. So, the power of the web is in its universality, access by everyone, regardless of disability, is an essential aspect. So, if you can only take one thing away from today, that your efforts in making your content accessible can help many others and not just those um, that are disabled. So, yeah, thank you. So, I know we're a bit short on time, but if anyone has any more questions, I'm happy to take them. I don't know if you know this. Uh, like the answer to this question, but do you know how screen readers and um, treat um, like a learning management system or course management system when they get to it? Like, do they start reading all the things? Yeah, screen readers typically start top to bottom, so to speak. Um, mind you, that is what we call code pillars, so they're taking the code, not um, One of the, I didn't actually list it, but one of the um, evaluation tools that I Use is called Bang. So it's just a screen reader. It's a, a screen reader emulator. Mm -hmm. So in textual format, it will tell you what the screen reader reads. And mm -hmm. just, in textual, of course, it's a lot easier because you're like, okay, and like trying to listen to it. Mm -hmm. It's usually really fast. I've never been able to actually use a screen reader myself. It's training for your ears to listen to everything. But a screen reader emulator will do it in textual format to give you an idea of like this is what it reads. So you can kind of slowly go through it. The actual site. Okay, this is what it reads and this is what I see. Any other questions? Yeah, so this is actually online. Like I said, this is actually being run off the web right now. So, yeah, you'll get a link to it and everything. Um, I've, I've collected everyone's okay. email address, so after that, I will send a link um, with all the information. Thank you so thank much. You. Right. Well, thank you for coming. Thank you.